Hello, everyone. I am Keith Cooperschmidt, the CEO of the Copyright Alliance, and I want to welcome you to this installment of the Copyright Alliance's Copyright Academy. Today's episode is part of our series on the Copyright Claims Board, or CCB for short. In this series, the Copyright Alliance staff take an in-depth look into the processes and procedures of the CCB for copyright owners who are looking to understand more about the CCB. Today, we will be talking about different remedies that are available when a case is filed with the CCB. And to talk about these issues, we have with us here today, again, Rachel Kim, a Copyright Policy Counsel at the Copyright Alliance. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, for doing this. Now, before we discuss remedies that are available at the CCB, let's talk about the remedies that may be awarded by a federal court in copyright infringement cases. So let's start with actual damages. Rachel, can you explain what actual damages are? So the term damages um, is used to refer to a monetary form of legal remedy that can be awarded by a court. Um, so there are two kinds of monetary damages that can be awarded by a federal court in a copyright infringement case. The first kind is actual damages, and the second kind is statutory damages. Um, a copyright owner is able to pursue one of the two, uh, but not both. So actual damages aim to compensate the prevailing party for direct provable financial losses suffered from a copyright infringement or violation. And these can be calculated by factoring in different elements, um, including the profits obtained by the infringing party, um, loss of profits, loss of licensing fees, or any other financial loss resulting from the copyright infringement or violation. Um, and proving these losses um, is often very difficult, which is why copyright owners often choose to instead pursue the second type of damages, uh, statutory damages. All right, so uh, let's move on to the different type of monetary damages that are available in federal court, the one you just mentioned, statutory damages. Can you, Rachel, can you explain a little bit about what statutory damages are? Sure. Uh, so statutory damages are specific damages that are established by the law. And so unlike actual damages, they're not directly tied to profits or financial loss. Um, and under copyright law, the range of statutory damages that can be awarded by federal court is between $750 to $30,000 per infringed work. Um, and that lower range can actually be reduced to a minimum of $200 per infringed work for the cases of innocent infringement. Um, and conversely, the upper range can be increased to a maximum of $150,000 per infringed work in the case of willful infringement. Thank you. So to be awarded statutory damages in federal court, does the copyright owner have to register the copyrighted work with the U.S. Copyright Office first? Yes. So in order for the copyright owner to be awarded statutory damages um, in a federal court proceeding, they must have registered the work with the U.S. Copyright Office before the infringement starts or within three months of publication of the work. And uh, this time frame is, you know, what is considered timely registered for a work. So examples of how this rule works are discussed on um, our statutory damages FAQ page on copyrightalliance.org. So check that page out for more details. Um, but essentially, if the work is not timely registered, then the copyright owner is only allowed to pursue actual damages and not statutory damages. All right. So we've talked a lot about actual and statutory damages. Can you explain what the difference between actual and statutory damages are? And when you do that, uh, since it's up to the plaintiff copyright owner to choose which one they are seeking, can you explain why a copyright owner might choose one over the other? In other words, why they would choose statutory damages over actual damages or actual damages over statutory damages? Yeah, so um, as we talked about a little previously, um, actual damages, you know, are tied to the financial losses uh, arising from uh, the, the infringing activity. Statutory damages are set uh, ranges, you know, under copyright law. 
So providing evidence of actual damages can be burdensome and difficult to do because it often requires the copyright owner to show receipts and other proof of that actual financial loss or to discover information from the opposing party of the financial profits they gained from the infringing activities. So that's why copyright owners could choose to pursue statutory damages instead, since again, the damage amounts um, under statutory damages are already set in the statute, in the Copyright Act, um, and there are far fewer difficulties of providing evidence uh, of losses resulting from the infringement. Okay, so we've now talked about monetary damages uh, in terms of actual damages and statutory damages, but there are also other remedies available that have no monetary component whatsoever, right? So for example, can you explain what, uh, what injunctive relief is? Injunctive relief is a type of legal remedy in which a court will order the losing party to take a particular action or refrain from taking a particular action. Uh, so for example, a court could issue an injunction ordering the losing party to stop the infringing activity, or they can uh, issue an injunction ordering the losing party to turn over or destroy copies of an infringing uh, work, and other kinds of actions or inactions to address the harm that uh, the prevailing party is suffering uh, that cannot be fully addressed by money damages alone. All right, so let's talk about uh, attorney's fees and court costs. So can you recover those in federal court? And if so, under what circumstances can you do that? So attorney's fees and court costs um, can be recovered um, in, in the federal court proceeding. So the Copyright Act leaves it up to the court to decide whether to award the prevailing party, uh, those costs associated with reasonable attorney's fees and court costs. Um, you know, however, similar to statutory damages, in order to be awarded these costs and fees, the prevailing party uh, must have registered the works in question before the infringement occurred or within three months of publication. Again, you know, if they timely registered um, their works. All right, so to review, We've talked about actual damages. We've talked about statutory damages. We've talked about injunctive relief. We've talked about attorney's fees and court costs. Those are all remedies that are potentially available when a copyright owner brings a case, a claim, in federal court. So we're here to talk about the CCB. So now I have to ask the question that's on everyone's mind. Are all these remedies available when the copyright owner brings a case before the CCB? So to go through each type of remedy that we've talked about so far, the CCB can award actual damages or statutory damages, but there are some limits to the amount that they can award. And so we'll go into that into a little bit more detail. In terms of attorney's fees or court costs, um, or the cost in this case associated with bringing a case before the CCB, um, those generally cannot be recovered at the CCB, but there are um, instances, limited circumstances where the CCB can award these costs and fees. And then lastly, for injunctions, the CCB cannot in issue injunctions, you know, like a federal court can. Um, however, the CCB is permitted to issue something that's very similar to an injunction if the parties agree. Um, but again, we'll de discuss uh, these details a little bit more. All right, so you said there were limits on the amount of actual damages and also limits on the amount of statutory damages that you can get at the CCB. You know the people listening just want to hear what those limits are. After all, it is a small claims court. So maybe you can explain what those limits are a bit. So as you point out, there are uh, limits within this small claims copyright court system in terms of the damages. So the CCB can never award more than $30,000 in any one proceeding, regardless of whether they are awarding actual or statutory damages. Um, but there is a difference between actual and statutory damages in terms of how much money can be awarded by the CCB on a per infringed work basis. So if a party is seeking actual damages, uh, there is no per work limit on the damage award, you know, so to speak. So as long as the total amount um, doesn't exceed $30,000 per proceeding. Um, so in other words, the CCB can award up to $30,000 in actual damages in any one proceeding, 
regardless of whether that award is for one work or spread across multiple works in the case. Uh, however, where a party is seeking statutory damages, the CCB can only award a maximum of $15,000 per infringed work. Um, although there is an exception to that that we'll discuss later. Um, so just to you know, provide some examples of you know, how these numbers work, uh, let's consider a claimant who is bringing an infringement claim and they're seeking statutory damages. So again, these are the damages that are you know, prescribed under law and there's a range. So if the claimant files a claim for one work with the CCB, the most the CCB can award that claimant is $15,000. If that same claimant were to file a claim, but for two works in that one proceeding, the most the CCB can award the claimant is $30,000 or $15,000 maximum for both works. Because again, the maximum amount of statutory damages per infringed work is $15,000. And if that same claimant were to file an infringement claim in one proceeding for three or more works, the most the CCB can award that claimant is $30,000 in statutory damages. So in that case, the claimant could not be awarded more than uh, awarded $15,000 or you know, uh, more than $15,000 for each work at issue in the case because there are three or more works. So the limitations we've discussed all apply where the claimant has filed a claim with the CCB through the standard process. Um, but again, you know, just a reminder that in the CCB, there's also a smaller claims process um, that a claimant can file a claim through where the total damages that the CCB can award there is limited to $5,000 total, regardless of whether the damages awarded are actual or statutory damages. So that's another consideration and, and uh, limitation to keep in mind. All right, so you mentioned that in order to get statutory damages in federal court, you must timely register your work. Is that true when a claimant files a case to the CCB too? So no, unlike in federal court, even if a work is not timely registered, again, meaning the work was registered before the infringement occurred or within three months of publication of the work. Um, so unlike in federal court, the copyright owner in the small claims court can still be awarded statutory damages by the CCB, again, even if the work wasn't timely registered. However, for works that are not timely registered, the statutory damages will be more limited in the CCB. So in those instances, the CCB can award $7,500 per infringed work and a total of $15,000 for all infringed works. Again, these are all works that are not timely registered. And that's, you know, as opposed to the maximum amount of $15,000 per infringed work and a total of $30,000 in any one proceeding, um, as discussed previously, again, if the works were timely registered in those cases. So again, just to concretize it a little bit, for example, let's consider a claimant who is bringing an infringement claim and they're seeking statutory damages, but Unlike in the previous examples, they have not timely registered their work or works involved in the proceeding. So the claimant goes and files their claim for one work, again, uh, which has not been timely registered. The most the CCP can award that claimant is $7,500, again, because it's $7,500 per infringed work. Um, if the claimant files a claim for one work, uh, for sorry, two works, both which were not timely registered, the most the CCB can award the claimant in that case is $15,000 or $7,500 for both works. And if that same claimant were to file an infringement claim in one proceeding for three or more works, none of which were timely registered, the most the CCB can award that claimant is still $15,000 in statutory damages um, which calculates on an infringed, on a per infringed work basis, you know, less than $7,500 per work. So in that case um, of three or more works in an infringement claim where none of them are timely registered, 
the claimant could not be awarded the maximum $7,500 per infringed work at issue in the case. All right, that's, that's, that's a lot of math, but I think <laughs> uh, folks should, should get that. Um, so we talked about the fact that the claimant gets to choose whether to pursue actual or statutory damages for infringement claim. And we talked about that they get to choose that in federal court. They also get to choose that um, in the CCB. So can you explain when the party would make that decision? Is it the beginning, is it the end, somewhere in the middle? When do they get to make that decision? So a claimant, a CCB claimant or a CCB counterclaimant can elect whether they are pursuing statutory or actual damages at any time before the CCB makes its final determination and according to any schedules established by the CCB. Um, so, so again, the claimant or counterclaimant can make this election when filing the infringement claims or infringement counterclaims, uh, but they're not required to make that election you know, definitively at this early stage of the proceedings. All right, and as usual, we talked about actual damages, statutory damages, so let's move on to attorney's fees and costs. What are the limits that the CCB places on attorney's fees and costs? So in general, uh, each CCB party will be responsible for paying their own CCB costs, for example, the filing fees um, and their attorney's fees if they have you know, legal representation. Uh, however, in the very limited circumstances, uh, the CCB may require the losing party to pay the prevailing party's fees and costs. So where a claim is dismissed because the CCB determines that after filing the claim with the CCB, the claimant you know, failed to keep up with the CCB case, for example, failing to meet multiple deadlines or not showing up at hearings um, or pursued a claim for an improper purpose, the CCP can award the respondent party fees and costs against that claimant. And on the flip side, the CCB can award fees and costs against a, res a respondent, um, you know, when the CCB finds uh, that the respondent pursued a counterclaim or defense for harassment or other improper purposes. Um, so when the CCB determines that an award of fees and costs is warranted, they can award a maximum of $5,000 when the prevailing party is represented by an attorney. If the prevailing party is not represented by an attorney, um, the, the maximum amount is $2,500. Um, but the CCB does have some room to exceed these maximums when there are um, extraordinary circumstances, such as, you know, demonstrated practice or pattern of bad behaviors, but that would be very, very limited circumstances. Um, and again, just going back to the fact that there's, you know, this limitation, this additional limitation under the smaller claims process, where the limit um, of total damages that can be awarded by the CCB in a smaller claims proceeding is $5,000. All right, thanks, Rachel. So I'm gonna make you go back to something you said at the very beginning when we were talking about the fact that injunctions are not available at the CCB. In other words, you can't get somebody to, to stop what they're doing through what's called an injunction, which you can get in federal court, but you can't get it at the CCB. But you said that there's something like an injunction that, that might be available. So can you explain what that is and, and how that comes about? Can you explain a little bit about what this, this alternative to an injunction is? Absolutely. So um, like we talked about earlier, unlike in federal court, the CCB cannot issue injunctions that order the losing party to perform a certain action or refrain from taking a certain action, like stopping the infringing activity or taking down an infringing copy of the work uh, from the website, et cetera. Um, however, you know, this alternative kind of injunction-like relief is that if the parties reach an agreement where one party agrees to cease or mitigate certain con conduct, you know, like stopping the infringing activity, um, the CCB can include that agreement in its determination, in its final determination. And so as a result, that agreement between the parties to, again, cease or, you know, stop a certain conduct 
it can accomplish the same uh, purposes and 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 goals, you know, as an injunction. So, um, you know, but it's also worth noting that when determining the amount of damages, the CCB can actually take into consideration whether the parties have reached such an agreement to, you know, cease or mitigate conduct. Um, so these are definitely things to keep in mind um, as parties move forward through the proceeding. All right. So we've talked since the beginning of this uh, webinar, we've talked about remedies for infringement claims, right? But there are other types of claims that can be brought before the CCB as well. Claims for a declaration of non-infringement and DMCA misrepresentation claims. And we haven't really talked about those. So my question to you is, since we're talking about remedies, can the CCB award remedies for these other types of claims as well? Yes, so the CCB can award remedies for all kinds of CCB claims. As you point out, there are three different types of claims, you know, two different types on top of infringement claims. However, um, statutory damages are only granted for infringement claims. And that's why unlike an infringement claim where the claimer and counterclaimant may elect either actual or statutory damages, CCB parties do not have to make that kind of choice when requesting remedies in a DMCA misrepresentation um, claim or a declaration of non-infringement claim. All right, so let's fast forward. Let's assume that the CCB has awarded damages, whether it's actual damages or statutory damages, whatever it may be. What can the prevailing party do? In other words, the party that wins, what can they do if the losing party refuses to pay that amount that the CCB says the losing party should pay? Is there any way for that prevailing party to enforce a CCB award? Yeah, absolutely. So if a losing party does not comply with the CCB's final determination and award, so they refuse to pay, you know, the damages that were awarded to the prevailing party, the prevailing party can bring an action in federal district court to enforce the CCB's determination. And this actually includes enforcing the injunctive style agreements that we talked about. Um, that the parties had agreed to in the CCB proceeding, you know, if that's part of the final determination. Um, but there is a way to enforce that. All right. So we have covered a lot of ground here. Uh, so it might be helpful to do a little quick recap of what some of the differences are between the remedies that are available in the CCB versus the remedies available in federal court. Sure. Sure. So again, in federal court, there is no limit in actual damages that can be awarded in a copyright infringement case. Um, that's why sometimes you see judgments, you know, in the millions of dollars. Um, at the CCB, the limit is $30,000 in total damages for a standard CCB proceeding. And then again, if, you, if uh, the claimant decides to go through the smaller claims proceeding, the total damages is limited to $5,000. Um, the next difference, you know, to keep in mind is that in federal court, the upper limits for statutory damages that a federal court can award for the infringement of a copyrighted work are much higher at $150,000 per infringed work versus the CCB's maximum of $15,000 in statutory damages, you know, per infringed work. Um, the next difference to keep in mind is the timely registration point. So again, you know, a work is considered timely registered if it was registered before the infringement occurred or within three months after publication of the work. So in federal court, if a work is not timely registered, uh, that work is ineligible to uh, get statutory damages. The federal court will not award statutory damages for those works um, versus the CCB, where the CCB can award statutory damages, but the limits are much lower, again, for works that are not timely registered. The last difference to keep in mind between remedies the federal courts can grant versus the CCB can grant 
um, is that federal courts can issue injunctions. And again, these are legal orders that direct a party to take a certain action or refrain from taking a certain action um, versus, you know, the CCB, where they cannot issue the same, you know, injunctions, but if the parties agree, again, to perform or not perform a certain action, like stopping the infringing activity, taking down the infringing copy, et cetera, that agreement can become part of the final determination. Um, and so it can result in sort of an injunctive style relief. All right, thanks, Rachel. So we have covered a lot of ground on remedies here today. Uh, and hopefully after watching this video, uh, claimants and other people who are watching this video will have a better idea of the type of remedies that are available when a case is filed with the CCB. But in the event you're watching this video and you still have some unanswered questions, uh, I recommend you can go to the Copyright Alliance's CCB Explained page on our website. So that's one thing that you can do to get more information. Or you can call our CCB hotline, and that number is 888 5403 CCB. Once again, that's 888 5403 CCB. I always feel like I'm on like late night television selling something when I do that. Um, anyway, but if you want more information, you can also check the numerous resources that are available at the Copyright Office's website. Uh, if you go to ccb.gov, they have a lots and lots of information there as well. So I want to thank you all uh, uh, for watching. I want to encourage you to keep an eye out for future videos about the CCB process that we're going to be posting um, if you're interested in learning more about the CCB. So once again, thank you very much uh, for, for watching uh, this educational video, and please come back for more information about the CCB.